Before we get started with a brand new season of Hockey Inside Out, I have to let you know about the fact that Hockey Inside Out has a newsletter. And if you want to take part in that newsletter, you want to subscribe, you want to get all the good stuff from Stu, Pat, Jack, Brendan, even, you know, every now and then an episode of Hockey Inside Out, go to MontrealGazette.com slash newsletters and subscribe to the Hockey Inside Out newsletter. Okay, that wasn't so hard. Let's get on with the show. I'm Julian McKenzie, the host of Hockey Inside Out. Back again with the usual suspects. We see Rick Green, former Montreal Canadiens defenseman, former number one overall pick, and of course, Stanley Cup champion. Jessica Rusnak is back from CBC Daybreak Montreal. What's up, Jess? And also, Stu Cowan is back. He wasn't there for the last episode we had last season, so it's the first time in a while we got to see him. Uh, we get to see him, of course, uh, from the Montreal Gazette. Hopefully, your summer vacations were good. Hopefully, they were, you know, busy. Or just maybe not that busy, but at least, you know, you got to relax a little bit, hopefully. Relax a little more than Mark Bergevin. <laughs> oh, geez. We'll get to Mark Bergevin, what he's been doing all summer. You know, this has been so, so crazy just over these last few months. A Stanley Cup final run, uh, the N- NHL draft and everything that's gone on with that, and all the player movement. And the first story we get to start off with is the fact that Yasperi Kakanyemi is no longer a member of the Montreal Canadiens. I did not have that on my bingo card of possibilities <laughs> for the Montreal Canadiens over the last few months. But lo and behold, the Carolina Hurricanes go the offer sheet route, and he's now a member of the Canes. We'll get to Christian Dvorak, who uh, immediately was straight to the Canadiens after the fact. But uh, Kakanyemi joining the Carolina Hurricanes. What are your takeaways from that whole ordeal and, and him now joining a new franchise? Well, the Hurricanes use the offer sheet option the way it's meant to be used. You have to make a sort of a crazy offer to a guy to be able to get him. And that's what it was for Kotkaniemi. They're willing to overpay him big time for one year at $6.1 million. Uh, I would bet money that they will sign him to an extension after January 1st when they're allowed to for maybe five, six years at a much more reasonable rate, maybe around $4 million. Uh, they wanted the player. Uh, they tried to trade for him before going the offer sheet route. Uh, there was a little bit of revenge thrown in there too after the Sebastian Ajo uh, offer sheet from the Canes, but I think some people have blown that out of proportion. I think the Hurricanes really wanted Jesperi Kakanyemi, and now they have the number two and number three overall picks from the same draft year, which rarely happens. You can go back to the Vancouver Canucks when they got the Sedin Twins uh, high in the first round. But I, you know, as I wrote after it, I think it, it was time for Kotkaniemi to move on from the Canadians, and it was time for the Canadians to move on from Kotkaniemi. And I think Mark Bergevin did the right thing by not matching the offer. I think it would have thrown his salary structure totally out of whack when you have Nick Suzuki coming up, you have Cole Caulfield coming up for new contracts. And then he made a smart move, and he took one of those first-round picks. He got his compensation, and he traded for Christian Dvorak. So we'll see what – right now I think Christian Dvorak – I'm pretty sure Christian Dvorak is a better hockey player than Jesperi Kotkaniemi – We'll see how things work out for Carolina. Carolina is going to put Kotkaniemi on the wing, playing with a couple of good players out of the Montreal Fishbowl. We'll see how he develops. But uh, at the end of the day, I think it was just time for, as I said, time for Kotkaniemi to move on and time for the Canadians to move on from Kotkaniemi, especially you know, matching that offer to me would have made no sense for the Canadians. Yeah, that was the right decision by Mark Bergevin not to match that. And and I think sometimes a change of scenery just scenery just helps with a player. And uh, for, yes, Barry Cockney, I mean, he wasn't developing the way that the Canadians might hope. Now you can point the finger at whoever when it comes to the development of this player. Yes, Barry Cockney, thought that he didn't kind of get the support that he needed from the organization. Mark Bergevin said, you know, it's on the player as well but it was the right move to do to just walk away from him and sort of thank him for the time with the Montreal Canadiens that whole revenge aspect of it obviously that was not the driving factor that they've been waiting for two years to see which player they would get but they had fun with it and there's not a big deal to have fun with things and and make sports uh you know a little bit more entertaining than just a regular offer sheet it got other people talking about the NHL which is a huge thing they want to grow the sport and maybe some new people started to decide they're going to start to follow hockey. And that's something that the Carolina Hurricanes said is their marketing team that was responsible for all that. They want to grow the game and good for them for having fun with it. So uh, I think, you know, Mark Bergevin made the best move from walk away. And I think the Carolina Hurricanes did a good move by having fun with this offer sheet. Yeah, and I, I, I think it was a good move uh, by Bergevin by not offering it. I think 
you know, with that type of price tag, uh, like we touched on before, throws his salary structure completely out of whack. But the bottom line for Kakinyemi, I think, is really uh, he wanted out. I don't think that he was happy with the relationship that he had here in Montreal. He faced a number of times criticism about his development. So, you know, he uh, he got tired of it a little bit. And I think that he wanted to uh, to get out of here. And, I mean, he obviously got a real nice bonus uh, by, you know, getting to Carolina. But, you know, the games that he was scratched and uh, some of the, uh, the conversation that you had, I think, behind the scenes, he was uh, really upset with that. And uh, he felt that he wasn't deserving of it, even though I think he, he was. But there is a, a situation where... You uh, you have ego with today's players, and you have to uh, you have to handle them with white gloves sometimes. But uh, like I said, the uh, the bottom line is it's a business. Uh, it, it was the best move for him to uh, to leave Montreal, and hopefully he's a good kid, and hopefully he's going to develop well with the type of players that they have in Carolina. And I think he will. Yeah, and I think you know when he was a healthy scratch for the last two games of the Stanley Cup final. After that, I think Kakinami wanted out. Didn't want anything more to do here. And to bring to give a kid six million dollars and bring him back when he's unhappy and he doesn't want to come back, that's not gonna that's not gonna work out well. And they would have also had to qualify him at six point one million again for the following season because I don't think Kakanyemi was gonna sign a four year or six year extension with the Canadians after January first, after what happened to him last season. So again, it was time to move on. And I agree with you, Jess. I thought it was hilarious what the Hurricanes uh, did with their Twitter account. I mean, the NHL is so far behind other leagues as far as just having fun sometimes. Sports are supposed to be fun. And it made me laugh. I, I thought it was pretty funny the way they handled it. Yeah, I, I thought it was really funny seeing them do that and seeing a whole bunch of fans just kind of lose their minds and, and say all these bad names for the Hurricanes franchise. Even if like Tom Dundon and, and Don Waddell are going to be like, oh, well, there wasn't a revenge factor. I sort of like to believe there totally was. And the Carolina Hurricanes did not shy away from that fact. I'm just curious now uh, with Yusperi Kakanyemi and the player that he might become. Like, uh, Stu, I think you're right in the fact that Christian Dvorak might be the better player right now, but everyone is enamored with what Jesperi Kakanyemi could become. And, and and I've made it clear about how I feel about how the Canadians sort of went about developing him to the player that he is right now. And I just wonder if the situation that he's in in Carolina will ultimately help him graduate to becoming that player that a lot of Canadians fans kind of expected him to be, this this the, the dependable center I, i've used the word sasha i've used the, the player comparable sasha barkoff with him uh as a light version of him maybe that's his ultimate ceiling but i don't know what you guys think do you, do you think in the situation that he's in in carolina that's good enough for cock and Yemi to eventually ascend to what like a number two center an everyday number two center or is he just going to be a number three center or a lars eller guy for the rest of his career well, for me, for me, the time is now, and he's, you know, he's be, going to be given an opportunity to play in some some key situations, and you know, he he has to show his his worth right now. He has to show that he's uh, he's coming along in a good way. I mean, here here's a classic example of a kid uh, that came in at a very young age that with his type of personality and the way he played. Uh, they take a little more time, and I mean, he has all the potential, the old potential word to develop into a real good player, but the time is now and, you know, this is an opportunity for him to play with some good players and make some things happen. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy for him and we'll look forward to, uh, to him uh, doing some good things because he is a, a really nice young man. You know, he showed his 18 year old that he could play center in the NHL, which is rare. I mean, he has the hockey smarts and the hockey IQ to do it. Uh, but I think moving him to the wing in Carolina is really going to help him. It's going to take that extra pressure in the defensive zone off of him. They did the same thing with Sebastian Au when they first had him. Um, I think it's a it's a if he, if it doesn't work out for him in Carolina, he's only going to have himself to blame with the way they seem to have set things up for him and the confidence they've shown in him with the six million dollar contract that the Canadians obviously didn't have that confidence. And also the pressure, you know, if he starts off at center and they move him back to the wing or have that whole kind of situation going it's not going to be talked about the way it's talked about here just remember with Alex Galchenyuk is he a centerman is he a winger in Carolina it's not that same kind of attention to the hockey team so I think he'll have a little bit more breathing room uh to develop as a player and not be under the spotlight constantly uh like he would be here in Montreal and the fact okay. that oh, fellow, I think the fact he has two fellow Finns in Carolina is going to help him also 
Uh, absolutely. I think he's in a good spot there. I have one final question about Jesper Kakin. I mean, I think it's the most important question to ask when it comes to this player. This guy has a $20 signing bonus. What is he going to spend that on in Carolina? And any, any recommendations on places he should go to or anywhere he should spend the $20 or $20 for a signing bonus? Like that's. He's got to go a lot further in Carolina than it will be in downtown Montreal. I'm about to say. He's, he's got to go to Chick fil A. That's yes. what he's got to spend it on. <laughs> yeah, spend, spend your money. He said he was going to give it to his mother as a Christmas gift. <laughs> but it, you know what though one of the things i loved about kaki i mean was in montreal was a sense of humor he's a really funny kid when he said he was going to give it to his mother i laughed i thought it was really that, that was a funny line i think that'd be good to do just you know every, thanks for everything you've done for me for my <laughs> nhl career here's 20 dollars uh jess let's go yeah. on with with christian dvorak uh who as we all know not long after the canadians said okay we're going to let Jesper Kakinami go to Carolina. They acquire Christian Dvorak from the Arizona Coyotes. I think most of us were on the, the press conference call with uh, Mark Bergman when they were talking about Christian Dvorak. What are your takeaways from the trade, and, and what do you think he brings to the Canadians? I think it's a great move by Mark Bergevin leading up until the day that they had to decide if they were going to sign the offer sheet or let him go. The questions were, well, who's going to replace? Yes, very cockney Emmy at center. And Mark Bergevin had a plan in place right away. He made a trade with Arizona and got Christian Dvorak, a player that he's been interested in for a few months, trying to make a deal uh, going, and it wasn't able to work out. He's 25 years old. He's a proven centerman something that this team absolutely needs. Uh, they need that veteran presence at center and not have too many centermen trying to develop and, and trying to give them uh, the, the time to develop as well. And I think he can help some other players on the team. Uh, you know, he's also had uh, 31 points last year. So he's a player who's able to put up some points, a really strong move uh, by Mark Bergevin to go out and get him. And from what I understand, he's a real good quality guy in the dressing room, and he was well liked uh, in Arizona. You know, uh, besides being a very good guy on the power play, he's uh, he's an honest worker, and I guess that uh, he's kind of one of those guys that's kind of off the radar, so to speak. But he brings a lot to the to the overall game, and he's uh, a real good uh, player that the coaches can work with, and he'll do you know whatever it takes to. Uh, uh, to get the job done. So a, a great addition, obviously, uh, strength down the middle. He's uh, he's a kid that's that's good at it. He's good on the power play. He's got a good shot. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it's a big bonus for the Canadians to have a guy like this. And notwithstanding the, the point that he uh, he's great in shootouts. Uh, he's one of the top guys in, in the shootouts with, uh, you know, six out of nine chances. So uh, all good stuff and looking forward to see what he can bring to the team. You know, Dvorak's going to be linked with Kakanyemi, obviously, but to me, he replaces Philip Dano more than he replaces Kakanyemi. And that, yes, with Dano, I was like, well, who's going to take all the key faceoffs now? Nick Suzuki's not good on faceoffs. Jake Evans had 50%, but he was taking faceoffs against fourth line centermen. He wasn't taking them against the, you know, the top centermen in, in, on the other team. So Christian Dvorak fills that hole. He also kills penalties like Philip Dano. He also plays the power play and has very much he scored a lot of goals in the power play, which is something that Dano didn't really do, although the Canadians never really, get, near, never really get an opportunity to play on the power play either. Uh, I think it was a huge pickup. I think they needed a veteran centerman down the middle. Uh, he fills that second centerman role behind Nick Suzuki. I don't think Suzuki's ready yet to play uh, the defensive role against the other team's top lines. Uh, Dvorak has proven that he can do that, a solid 200-foot player. And as Rick said, you know, he's one of those players out in Arizona. We don't get to see him that much. You don't hear about him that much. But from everything I've read and, and seen since the, they acquired him, uh, sounds like a stand-up guy. Uh, he was co-captain in London with Mitch Marner when they won the uh, Memorial Cup. Uh, put up huge offensive numbers in the, in the Junior League. And I think the fact he played in London, which is a huge hockey market for junior, it's probably in the Junior League, it's probably as close to playing in the NHL as you can come, playing in London. And, and he obviously thrived in that market. And I think coming to another hockey market will help him after playing in Arizona. And, you know, I've been, I've covered Canadian games in Arizona and man, that's a dead rink. Uh, you know, <laughs> the odds are there, half the fans are Habs fans and there's still maybe 10,000 people in the building. So I think for Dvorak, it's a good situation uh, coming to a hockey city. It's too bad he had just bought a house. <laughs> yeah. Was built. Uh, but I'm sure he'll be able to sell that. Uh, but again, I, I think he, I think he's, he's a, a good replacement for Phil Deneau. And as I said, when Phil Deneau left as a free agent, he's one of those players 
Canadians fans won't appreciate the way they probably should until he's gone. He leaves a big hole. Uh, same with Andre Markov. When Andre Markov left, I think we realized just how important Andre Markov was to the Canadians after he left, and I think it'll be a similar thing with Deno. However, I think the Vorak is uh, is a guy who can come in and and maybe uh, make that hole feel less. And it's Stu, just to pick up on a point about people not really knowing much about Christian Dvorak, I had so many people say, he's American? I thought yeah. he was from the Czech Republic or he's yeah. somewhere in Europe, but that they were really shocked to find out that he is American. Yeah, he's from Illinois. Yeah, yeah like like when I first heard of him, I forget when his draft year was, I, my first inclination was he's related to Radek Dvorak, who I think <laughs> is from the Czech Republic. But as far as I know, there's no relation between those two players. Uh, any early predictions on how many points he might get. I'm really interested in that because obviously with the line mates that he might get in Montreal, he will likely get an upgrade on Tyler Pitlick and Lawson Kraus in Arizona. This is also a guy who has not eclipsed the 40 point mark since he's been in the NHL. That being said, uh, this is a guy, as we've mentioned before, who's able to go up against the other team's best players and and likely gets a lot of those. That's big, probably a big reason why he doesn't get as many points as he should get because his offense probably has to take a step back when he has to go up against guys in the Western Conference like Anze Kopitar, for example. Any, any guesses as to how many points he could get this season with newer line mates and, of course, newer responsibilities? Uh, I think he I, his prorated, uh, you know, production. He, he averages eighteen goals uh, a year. So I mean, the guy can uh, he can score, and you know, if he brings that, he's going to uh, fill a little bit of a void with uh, that that type of uh, offensive uh, talent. So I mean, it's it's really uh, early to to say, but uh, let's see where he uh, he fits in. Uh, he obviously has the credentials to make some things happen. And uh, at least he's got the skill set that I think that uh, he can contribute quite a bit uh, offensively. And I'm sure that uh, everybody's hoping for that. Yeah, and the fact he's going to get be used on the power play, I think, quite a bit. I would say, you know, I'd be surprised if he doesn't get 50 points. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go with 40 that he's going to hit that 40 mark now. Make it 41 to make it interesting. OK, <laughs> all right. All right, something to look forward to once Christian Dvorak eventually puts on the Bleu Blanc Rouge uniform for this coming season. How many points will he get? Jonathan Drouin is the topic uh, that we're going to address next. He's obviously uh, a big topic to deal with because of the fact that we haven't seen him play in months. He was not with the team during the playoffs. He left before the regular season ended. But it seems as if he'll be back with the team. And there were all these reports going around that he even wanted to try out the center position again. I'm just curious about what type of player we'll get from Jonathan Drouin, but I'm also curious about what line mates he'll end up with. Where do you see him in this lineup? Well, for me, first off, I'm happy to hear that he's put these struggles behind him. You know, hopefully he's going to um, step into the lineup with a lot of positive, uh, you know, vibe with the team. I mean, he's, we don't know exactly what he's gone through other than he says that he's ready to go. Uh, that's a good thing. As far as where you position him, I mean, there's a kid that we saw, you know, bits and pieces of a really good, skilled, fast player that you know, can make things happen. And again, uh, I don't know whether you want to throw him into a situation where you, you put him in center uh, with more, you know, demand on defensive responsibilities or you, you keep him you know, on the wing and let him uh, do his thing, uh, uh, wheeling and dealing on the wing side. So I think it's a little bit of a trial and error right now. First and foremost, I think, is to get him back, get him uh, with the good mindset that he uh, he knows the kind of game that uh, is expected of him. And then, uh, you know, you can move him around because he has talent. He's shown it before. Now it's a matter of, you know, who do you, uh, who do you put him with and who can you maximize uh, his abilities by, uh, you know, loading him down the middle or putting him on the wing. So uh, time will tell with that one. Ducharme will make that decision, and uh, hopefully it will be a good one. Well, during uh, Dvorak's uh, Zoom conference, he was asked about a scouting report on him that says he plays best when he has a winger who can carry the puck. And mm -hmm. the person whose name jumped into my mind is Jonathan Drouin. There's a winger there it is. who loves to carry the puck. So I would think that it'll be Dvorak uh, will be playing with Drouin. Uh, that would be my pick anyway. Uh, it's, what's sort of fun now with all these new players and all these new wingers coming in is trying to figure out 
the line combinations for the season. You know, I was I was on paper jotting down some, and I was you know I had Bavorak with Drouin. And I was thinking Gallagher would be a good player on that line. Also, Gallagher's going to have obviously two new line mates after Tatar and Deno left. They had the Suzuki with the Foley and Caulfield. Uh, either Paquette or Perot, depending what happens at training camp at center between Hoffman and Anderson. And then you got a fourth line of Evans with Lekkonen and Armia. Um, but I think for me, I think Dvorak and Joy seems like a, like a good fit. And uh, with Gallagher, you know, the hard work that Gallagher puts in, I think that's a line that, uh, that could be interesting to watch, but it's going to be fun at training camp to see uh, what Ducharme does. And as I said, he's got so many wingers, uh, that he can mix and match and move around. So I think line juggling is going to be something that we'll see a lot this season just because of the the players that uh, Ducharme has now at his availability. Yeah, I do like that uh, line with uh, Dvorak and Gallagher. Gallagher is that spark plug. Maybe that's something that can help Jonathan Drouin get back in. You know, I'm sure there's probably some rust in his game uh, early on. Um, but I wouldn't start him at center. Like, keep him on the wing if they need to do that experiment and try him there. I know he said in the past uh, that he could, he would be interested in playing it. But you know what? Just keep him on the wing. Another one that could be, uh, I think, a good fit playing with Suzuki and Caulfield. Two young guys. That could be a really fun kind of line to, to get things started with him. But it's, it's going to be tough. I'm going to be uh, really looking forward to seeing what lines are going to create chemistry? What's going to be the big one leading the way uh, as uh, Dominic Ducharme is going to have a lot of work trying to put together this lineup? Yeah, I'd be shocked if we see Drouin at center again. You know, been there, done that. Uh, you know, he has this interview coming up Monday with Chantal Maccabee and RDS. We'll see what we find out from that. But there's going to be enough pressure on him already going into this season. I think putting him at center would make no sense. Plus, the Canadians have enough centers right now, I think, to fill that role. Um, so, you know, as, as Rick said, I mean, being around Jonathan Joy in the locker room pre-COVID, he's a nice kid. He's a fun kid to be around. It's 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 unfortunate what happened uh, with him, and hopefully he can put that behind him and move forward. But in this market, it's not going to be easy. No, nope. it's not going to be easy for him at all, but I hope he is able to put whatever struggles, as, as Rick and, and everyone on this panel has mentioned before, I hope he's able to put those struggles behind him. I'll just say that, the Christian Dvorak trade essentially negates any reason to put Jonathan Drouin at center for the time being. Otherwise, like maybe you consider it. I, I know uh, a couple of weeks back, I, I put out a poll uh, on my Twitter asking fans uh, if they'd rather see Jonathan Drouin or Mathieu Perrault take uh, some center duties. And more of those fans went for Mathieu Perrault, a guy who I think acknowledged he had back problems from playing center. He doesn't seem like a guy who wants to be at that position. So the fact that the Canadians, not to go back to a topic we already discussed in Christian Dvorak, that also <laughs> takes care of, of their center depth to a certain extent, and not having to move someone who probably isn't the best fit at that position in Drouin or a Mathieu Perrault to the center position. So I, I, I mean, the Dvorak trade is what it is, but Jonathan Drouin at this point, I have no clue what we're going to get from this guy who hasn't played in quite some time, who's now going to focus all his energy into playing hockey who knows what his future is going to be beyond this year. I, look, just put him in a, a best, best of a situation as you can. Uh, playing alongside a Christian Dvorak, I think, would work. Just don't put him at center. Like, if you put him at center, it's just a recipe for a disaster. You're just asking him to go through a whole bunch of needless attention. And I'm sorry, but I think some of those fans who were pretty critical of him uh, at the end of last season – who may have even had some sympathy for him as he was going through uh, what he was going through, they might go back to hating him again. And, and in this market, it's just it's just way too volatile of a market for him to, to kind of go through another bad time at center. Just leave him on the wing, let him play second line minutes, maybe third line if you have to, but like a middle six approach. Like put him in the best possible position you can. Uh, I don't know if anyone else had any other extra thoughts on this. Well, I mean, I, I know that the center position is very demanding and, you know, you have to be very, very responsive defensively. But, you know, on the other side, if Jonathan Drouin really puts his mind to it and really commits himself to say, OK, this part of my game I have to get better at uh, in the defensive zone working down deep, then I have to do that. And, I mean, I, I'm just hopeful that this, this kid uh, – uh, figures out that he's got to do something really well each and every night. And I think we've talked about his inconsistencies before. And, uh, you know, I, I think they have the, uh, the, the luxury, if you will, of having a, 
a, a number of players that they can insert and, and take out and move the pieces around to see who's really going to complement each other and have that type of chem chemistry. So I wouldn't rule out anything. Jonathan Drouin, I, I'm just, uh, you know, bottom line for me is I'm hoping that uh, he, he feels good and he's going to bring something uh, that he teased a lot of people with occasionally uh, last year. Yeah, we're talking about the center position. Also, one of the sort of forgotten guys is Ryan Palin, right? I mean, yeah. I, I would expect he's going to start the season in Laval, but Mark Bergeron likes to say players make decisions for him by how they perform in training camp. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what Ryan Paling does also. There's another guy, you know, former first-round draft pick, that uh, when you're looking down the lineup, uh, it can be easier right now to sort of forget about him. But it'll be interesting to see not only at training camp, but through the season, how Ryan Paling uh, develops and if the Canadians think – He's ready to take a spot in the NHL. And I wonder after what happened with Cut Kanyemi, if maybe they might want to show a little bit more confidence in Ryan Paling uh, so that they don't end up in a similar situation to what they were with Cut Kanyemi. Uh, at least uh, Mark Bergman was willing to acknowledge that maybe they could have handled Kakanyemi better. And maybe that approach, a newer approach, is already working on a guy like a Ryan Paling or a Cole Caulfield. Speaking of Mark Bergman, in terms of the roster moves that he's done over the offseason, a laundry list of them, of course. Do you think he's done? Do you see him maybe adding someone to a PTO or maybe adding another depth center or, or another player to add to the piece of his puzzle? Well, this is the second straight offseason. Mark Bergeron has made major changes to his roster. And we know what happened last year. They went all the way to the Stanley Cup final with it. Uh, I think he's made some good moves again this offseason. I think if I'm Mark Bergeron, I'm, I'm still a little worried about my defense. Uh, I think I'd be looking to see if I can find the proven top four NHL defensemen. Uh, as of now, it looks like David Savard is probably going to play with Ben Sherrod unless they show a lot more confidence in Romanov than they did in the playoffs last season. And, you know, when at Ducharme's golf tournament, when he said that uh, Savard is basically the same player as Shea Weber, I was like, really? <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're both Good player, big. but no. <laughs> they're both big. But, uh, you know, Shea Weber logged monster minutes against top players, top three, you know, top forward lines. Uh, David Savard, you know, plus minus is one of those stats you have to take with a grain of salt, as Rick Green knows, sometimes a big grain of salt. But David Savard was minus 19 in 40 games with uh, Columbus, and he was minus 8 in 14 games uh, with Tampa in the regular season as a third-pairing defenseman. So I think if you've got David Savard going up against top six forwards on a regular basis, I don't know if that's a, a good situation. Uh, I think you might want to have somebody else step into that top four uh, role on the blue line. And maybe Alexander Romanov is the guy, but you know they didn't have any confidence in him in the, in the Stanley Cup final last season. Uh, so that would be my concern if I was Bergevin. I'd be a little nervous right now about my defense. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be any more major moves before the season starts. I think Mark Bergevin is going to kind of sit back and wait and see what kind of moves that he he can make. And, and to get, you know, top four defensemen, it's not that easy to make those moves to acquire those kind of players. So it's going to take time. I think he also wants to see what his team has to offer if there's going to be a player who steps up that wasn't maybe on the radar beforehand. So I think he made all the moves that he has uh, before the season starts, and then as the season will progress, I'm sure we'll see Mark Bergevin make some moves. Yeah. And I, I think it's he's going to be quiet. I think he's made enough uh, uh, moves in the off season to bring in some new faces, and I don't I don't foresee uh, anything major happening with his group. He, he has he has depth, I think, in uh, in the forward uh, group, and he you know even on the blue line. And not to say that uh, if something came along that he. Uh, he couldn't find somebody, maybe a, a offensive uh, type defenseman that they could bring in, but that's uh, that's tough to do. And you know, let's uh, let's see how this group plays out. Let's see how they uh, they work together and how they progress. And uh, then he'll obviously address some problem areas if he, he sees them arising. Yeah, as of now, I mean, Jeff Petrie is the only really defenseman they have that you can see generating offense. After that, you know, the other guys are not offensive style defenseman well i would love i would love to see romanoff uh, step in there uh, and again i've uh, i've spoken highly about him before i don't believe that he's been given a fair chance to show what he's capable of showing and i uh, hope again they, they realize that he's got tremendous upside if he plays and i think he can bring a lot to uh, you know to to the offensive part of the defenseman uh, that they do have 
Okay. I have one last question for you all here. We I know we 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 joke about how short the off season has been. Uh, a lot of media types like ourselves have, have been definitely uh, just trying to rest up as much as we can over these last few weeks, considering how short it was. What do you think that toll is going to be like on the players going from a Stanley Cup final to a short to a shortened off season and training camp is within the next few days? Like, like, what do you think that toll will be like on those guys? I, I do think that it is going to, um, you know, maybe slow them down a little bit uh, just because of how it was. I want to even say that round against Vegas, the travel with that, the time difference, that was a lot on the players. And then going that far into the playoffs, there's so many injuries that occur. So the players need a little bit more time to let their body heal before they can get back to fully training. And, and Rick, you could probably speak more to this, but the players need to kind of just, you know, take a break once the season's done, turn their mind off, don't train, and then get back to it and start getting ready for the regular season. So I think that, you know, it might affect the Canadians to start the season. Um, but you know what, these players are professional i don't think it's gonna hurt them a, a huge amount but i do think that they're maybe at a little bit more of a disadvantage than some of the other players who did not go so long in the playoffs and i think that these guys are well-conditioned machines unlike what we were like uh, <laughs> these guys stay in shape and they are amazing athletes and you know i i think that you know the the, the main point here is they have to stay in the mix no matter what happens uh, obviously, uh, you know, they can't let themselves fall behind. Uh, and everybody's, you know, facing uh, a whole different scenario this year. You've got different travels uh, happening and, you know, division play. So uh, there's there's a lot of teams that are going to be dealing and, and feeling uh, quite a bit different from what they were this past year. But uh, the, the main point is, hey, listen, you've got to get it done. These guys uh, know that they have to uh, they have to make the playoffs, and uh, hopefully they're going to uh, do that. I mean, you know, Shea Weber wasn't the only banged up guy at the end of the playoffs last season. You know, Brendan Gallagher, Toffoli both had groin issues. Uh, so, you know, how how did that impact them as far as how long it was before they could start training again for this season? I think that's something uh, that's going to be a bit of concern. As Rick said, these guys train 12 months a year. They're always in top shape. It's not like they show up at training camp 10 pounds overweight after drinking beer all summer. Uh, but that's <laughs> the other, my biggest concern going into this training camp is Carey Price. You know, he had that knee surgery. Um, the cancer said it was minor, but when his wife posted on her Facebook page, it seemed like they were a little bit more concerned going into that knee surgery than the Canadians had let on. And the Canadians say he will be ready for the start of training camp or he should be but I can't remember a time when the Canadians were ever right when they predicted how long Carey Price would be off uh, from an injury or surgery or whatnot. Um, so, you know, he had the knee surgery. So how much training was Carey Price able to do during the off season? I imagine not much. And uh, that to me, that's the biggest concern for the Canadians coming into training camp is Carey Price. And will he be ready for training camp? Will he be ready for the regular season? And how will he perform after a short, very short off season and coming off knee surgery. So that's, uh, that's I think, something to keep an eye on uh, at training camp. And as again, I said, the Canadians, I can't remember them ever being right when they predicted uh, a return from an injury for Carey Price. Oh, I can't wait for this season <laughs> now. I, are, the, are the Canadians good enough to go back to the Stanley Cup final? When are we going to get Carey Price back? Is Mark Bergevin, is this his last stand as general manager of the Montreal Canadiens? How is Mike Hoffman going to do? Christian Dvorak, Nick Suzuki, Cole Caulfield. Is he going to win Calder Trophy uh, at the end of the year for Rookie of the Year? So many questions. So many storylines. And you better believe that we're going to go through all of them throughout this season. Hockey inside out, of course. I was really happy we got to see each other again for the first time in weeks. This was really fun, guys. Uh, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Hockey Inside Out. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you have not already done so. Visit HockeyInsideOut.com to check out more of our content. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the Hockey Inside Out newsletter. Go to MontrealGazette.com slash newsletters. Bye, guys.